Hello, Storyline, and welcome to our ongoing series on the life of Jacob. We are in part seven of seven. Yes, this is going to be our final presentation in the series, and I know that throughout the series I have gone back and forth vacillating about whether or not this will be a seven-part series or an eight-part series, seven or eight, eight or seven. And to be totally honest, real talk here, I'm even uncertain right now about how to end this series because this really could be a 10, 11, 12 or more part series. And, and there's no easy, nice, natural place to end this. So I've gone back and forth about where to end it and how to end it. But last night, literally last night in prayer, I just it just came to me. I was awake uh, at like one in the morning and it, I just saw it in my mind's eye and I knew, nope. This is how you're gonna end it. It needs to be a seven part series. And so this is our seventh and final part of the Jacob series titled, Jacob, the Faking, Breaking, and Making of a Man. Sorry to disappoint you if you were hoping for an eight part series, but this is just the way that I feel impressed to do it. And I think you're going to love it. Now, having said that, we've got a lot of material to cover because I wanna land this in just the right way. And it is so powerful, in fact, Again, real talk, I am giddy with excitement and enthusiasm about the material that we're going to be going over today. We're going to be in chapters 31, 32, and 33. Most of our time, though, the lion's share of our time is going to be in chapter 32. So welcome, Storyline. So glad you're tuning in. As I said, this is the seventh of a seven-part series. So if you're just tuning in for the first time, please, I'm pleading with you, by all means, go back and listen to parts one, two, three, four, five, and six, so that you can get you know, the, the full story of Jacob's life and, and really feel the force of where we're going to end. And uh, without further ado, I'm just, I'm overflowing here with enthusiasm and I wanna get into this. So let's start with prayer and we're gonna have a great time together. Father in heaven, bless us now as we open your word. Lord, you know my heart, you know my enthusiasm, you know my passion for this story. Lord, I see myself in this story. And I think all of us, if we'll come to this story with an open heart and an open mind, we'll see ourselves in the life of Jacob. That's why even though it's an ancient story, it's so relatable, it's so relevant, it's so timeless. And so, Father, now as we open the text of Scripture, may you by your Spirit open our hearts and may you speak to us powerfully right now is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's get right into this. Our seventh and final uh, session is titled... Your name is Israel. Your name is Israel. And we're going to be going through, as I've mentioned here, quite a little bit of material. And we're going to be basically be, as I've said, in the latter part of chapter 31, all of 32, and then a little bit of chapter 33. The life of Jacob continues on uh, past Genesis chapter 33, but there's no nice, neat, easy place to land the life of Jacob. And so in, in my mind, because this is my series and I'm the one writing it and preaching it, I feel like this is the place we're going to end. And we're going to look at basically three things today, three hostile encounters, Jacob's hostile encounter with Laban, Jacob's hostile encounter with God, and then Jacob's what he imagines to be hostile encounter with Esau. So let's start off by also reminding ourselves that Jacob's life has been a life of ongoing, uninterrupted struggle and conflict, right? With Esau in utero, with Esau over the birthright, with Laban, which we've been talking about in the last few sessions, with his own wives and children, the naming of the children back and forth, the rivalry and struggle that was taking place within his own home. What we're going to see here is the struggle against Yahweh, that's number five, the struggle with Esau again. And all of this is undergirded by number eight there, this, this idea that what's really taking place is that Jacob is a man not at peace with himself. He's a man at war with himself, and uh, I, I just can't wait. All right, so we're in chapter 31, and we're gonna pick up exactly where we left off here. Jacob is now fleeing. He has left the land of Laban, and he has been asked by God, by the God of Abraham and Isaac, who has recapitulated the Abrahamic covenant and promised to him to go back to his native land. And so we're gonna pick it up in verse 22. It says, on the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. Taking his relatives with him, he pursued Jacob for seven days and caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. Then God came to Laban, the Aramean, in a dream at night and said to him, now this is God speaking to Laban, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country of Gilead. 
when Laban overtook him and Laban and his relatives camped there too. So God appears in a vision because he knows the anger, the frustration, and even the violence that is in Laban's heart. And so he appears to him in this vision and says, don't even think of harming this man and don't say anything to him, good or bad. And it's funny there that God says, don't say anything good or bad, because he knew that even when Laban said something good, he was such a clever, manipulative person. He basically says, just shut up and leave the man alone. Now, if you're beginning to feel that there's a kind of symmetry here to the Jacob story, then you're reading it right. And we've, I've got here on the screen here a number of similarities or symmetries between Jacob, who has already been a man on the run and who is now, again, a man on the run. Let's just go through these quickly. In both cases, when he left his homeland and now when he's leaving to go back to his homeland, we see these similarities and symmetries. Number one, a hurried flight from his home. Number two, a family crisis over what belongs to him, rightly or wrongly. Number three, it's a deception. Here he's, he's leaving in the night. He's, he's deceiving his, his father-in-law. He doesn't want him to know that he's leaving. In both cases, the threat of harm and of pursuit. In both cases, Jacob is in a fearful and uncertain state of mind or frame of mind. In both cases, he will have an encounter with angels. We haven't yet gotten there, but that's what takes place right at the beginning of chapter 32. In both cases, he will have what theologians call a theophany, right? A, a supernatural transformative encounter with God. And then in both cases, there will be a safe arrival after a lengthy and challenging journey. And so the way the story is being told, there's this real similarity and this real symmetry so that what we've experienced before, we're now going to experience again. And those symmetries and similarities are going to continue as you will see. All right, let's pick the narrative back up. Verse 26, then Laban said to Jacob, what have you done? You deceived me. There's our word. The deceiver is once again deceived. You carried off my daughters like captives in war. Why did you run off secretly and deceive me? Why didn't you tell me so I could send you away with joy and singing to the music of timbrels and harps? You didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters goodbye. You have done a foolish thing. I mean, frankly, this is, this is I'm not going to accept this from Laban. This is not acceptable. He tries here unpersuasively to present himself as a concerned and dedicated family man, right? Somebody who wanted to throw a big celebration. Now, we need to remember his track record and his daughter's recent assessment. Remember when Jacob called Rachel and Leah into the field and said to them, look, at, look, this is what I'm planning to do. I'm planning on leaving. This is part of what they said to Jacob about their own father, right? Not father-in-law, but their own father. Verse 15, does he not regard us as foreigners? Not only has he sold us, but he has used uh, he, he has used up what was paid for us. And so they say then in verse 16, just do whatever God has told you. In other words, they are emotionally cut off from their own father. So this, you know, this charade about, oh, I wanted to throw a big party and I wanted to kiss my daughters. And my... No, it, we, we should not be receiving a bar of this. It's not at all consistent with the way that Laban has presented himself up to this point in the narrative. He's far more concerned about his own financial opportunities than he is about his family's happiness and his daughter's happiness, as we've already seen. Now we actually get a window, as the narrative continues, into Laban's actual frame of mind, and we know that he's not this kind, compassionate, concerned family man. Look at verse 29. I have the power, he says, to harm you. Well, there you have it. He says, I could hurt you right now if I wanted to, but he was afraid because last night the God of your father said to me, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now you have gone off because you long to return to your father's household, but why did you steal my gods? Now, this happened a little bit earlier in the chapter, and we kind of ran over it quickly, but, but Rachel had gone in and stolen the little sort of figurines, these little deities that were used to symbolize the god or gods that Laban worshipped. Now, Jacob is not aware of this, and he doesn't know that those gods have been stolen. And as we're going to see here in just a moment, he's going to insist, I didn't take anything, we didn't take anything, and what are you talking about stolen gods? I will just briefly observe that any god, quote unquote, or gods that can be stolen are not real gods, right? Don't they have the power or the ability to resist being taken or stolen? And we're supposed to see an irony here and, and even a little humor in the idea that one God is the true God. He's Yahweh. 
He calls people from place to place where these other gods, these counterfeit gods of Laban, they can be, you know, ferried around from place to place. In fact, as we'll soon see, these, these gods are hidden in such a way so as to be, in the narrative, purposefully uh, shameful and in a way that actually shows that the gods have no power or dignity or significance at all. Okay, verse 31, Jacob answered Laban, I was afraid. That's why I fled. I was afraid because I thought you would take your daughters away from me by force. And Jacob's telling the truth here. He's, he's telling you, I know what kind of a man you are. Just moments ago, you said you have the power to harm me, you have the power to do violence to me, which assumedly he would have done if God hadn't specially interposed. So then, and we're not going to read this part, but, but Jacob basically says, look around, we don't have your gods, because again, he doesn't know that Rachel has stolen them. And Laban goes rifling through the tents and through everything, trying to find them. But Rachel has actually hidden them under her saddle, right, under her saddle. And, and she says, oh, I can't get up because it's that, it's that time uh, for me. It's the time of women. And so she uh, pretends to be menstruating. And here again is this idea that these gods are, they can't do anything. And having these gods being hidden underneath the saddle of a menstruating woman is basically a, a not so subtle way of saying they're powerless. These gods can do nothing, even when they find themselves, you know, in a very uncomfortable situation, there's nothing they can do about it. And so it's, it's supposed to be a jab at these other quote unquote gods. So after he's rifling around and not finding anything, Jacob, Jacob, He's not having it anymore, verses 36 and onward. Jacob was angry, and he took Laban to task. And what takes place here is an almost kind of semi-formal court scene, right? And it has these elements of accusation and of defense and of evidence. And it's quite a fascinating, it would be great to preach just a single sermon on that, looking at it through the lens of the great controversy. Uh, here, verse 36, Jacob was angry, and he took Laban to task and said, Wait, what is my crime? He asked Laban, how have I wronged you that you hunt me down? Now that you have searched through all my goods, what have you found that belongs to your household? Put it here in front of your relatives and mine. There's the jury, right? And let them judge between the two of us. There's this, you know, very obvious sort of quasi court scene here. And I would like to suggest that you can really feel the tide turning here. The relational dynamic has shifted and Laban is no longer in clever control of a compliant and manipulable son-in-law. No, he's not having it and he's over it. And then Jacob gives this beautiful, emotionally charged, impassioned speech, and it gives us a window into what Jacob's life has been like over the last two decades. Verse 38, he says, I have been with you for 20 years now. Your sheep and your goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten rams from your flocks. I did not bring you animals torn by wild beasts. And this is, this is fascinating. There's a little hint of the gospel here. I bore the loss myself. Jacob as the shepherd bears the loss himself. We'll come back to that in a second. And you demanded payment from me for whatever was stolen by day or night. This was my situation. The heat consumed me in the daytime and the cold at night and sleep fled from my eyes. Now, my wife's father, a wonderful godly man who I, I love so much and have so much respect for, a man by the name of Zaharia, he grew, up, he grew up in Romania, and as a young boy, I mean a young boy like ages 8 to 12, he was already a shepherd wandering barefoot in the hills in and around his home of Constanza, Romania. And he has told me and uh, his uh, sons and daughters and our children uh, some of the stories of what it's like to be a shepherd. It's not easy to be a shepherd. And that's what Jacob's saying here. Man, it was hot in the day and it was cold at night and I couldn't get any sleep because when you're a shepherd, you are committed, you are devoted, you are, you are all wrapped up in the lives of your sheep. It's not just the kind of job you can go check in, check out. No, you're there, you're in the hills, you're in the mountains, you're sleeping in the dirt. It's hot, it's cold, it's raining, it's hard. Right, it's hard, and that's what he says here. He basically lays out his case of how hard he's been working and how devoted he has been. And this little speech here is, and really it's a defense in this, again, quasi court of law, is a beautiful and compelling picture of the tireless and unseen dedication of a devoted shepherd. And it would be impossible for us as followers of Jesus and as Christians to not immediately read in that description of the dedicated life of a devoted shepherd, 
John chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. This is what would have been understood by the people to whom Jesus was speaking in his day, who were all familiar with shepherds. They were a far more agriculturally connected world and society than we are today. And so when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, they would have all gone, whoa, that's commitment. That's devotion. That's hard work, right? That's being in the trenches. I am the good shepherd. And then this, I lay down my life for the sheep. That's, that's what was being hinted at there when, when Jacob said, I bore the loss, right? I bore the loss. I was the one who took upon myself the responsibility if a sheep was lost, if a sheep was injured, if a sheep was killed by a predator. I bore the loss. Well, Jesus, he bears the loss. And we're going to get to that in just a little bit. So it's absolutely beautiful. And uh, Jacob's impassioned speech continues. He says, it was like this for 20 years. I was in your household. I worked for you for 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks. And you changed my wages 10 times, right? We've already had a, we've talked about that. You know, Jacob said, if, if you, uh, he had that dream in which uh, if it was the speckled sheep, then all this, if, if, if Laban said, hey, I, mine are the speckled and yours are the spotted. Well, then the spotted would proliferate. And when he would change, God would always change to show that he was blessing. His, his blessing was upon Jacob. And so he says, you changed my wages over and over again to try to bring, you know, an equalization between. But, but God was blessing me and God wasn't blessing you. Here are your little figurine gods. They didn't bless you. But my real God, the true God, the creator God, Yahweh, was blessing me. Verse 42, if the God of my father, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, you would have surely sent me away empty handed. Here he gets right to the punchline. And here's where we really see the kind of person that Laban is. Well, we've been seeing it all through the narrative, but Jacob puts his finger right on it. And he says, you know good and well, I know, everybody here knows, your daughters know, this is how you would have treated me if you could have, but God has seen my hardship and the toil of my hands. We've already talked about that. God sees it. God has seen it. And then Jacob says, and last night in the dream, he rebuked you. Well, Laban's answer is weak and ineffectual, and it shows just how delusional and selfish he is. Laban answered Jacob, the women are, and just, I've bolded this so you don't miss it. The women are my daughters, and the children are my children, and the flocks are my flocks. All you see is mine. A petulant little boy who's been finally exposed for his selfishness. Yet what can I do today about these daughters of mine or about the children they have born? And then he lamely says, come, let's make a covenant, you and I, that will serve as a witness between us. And they make a couple piles of rocks there. And effectively, they say, you know, you won't go past this pile of rocks and I won't go past this pile of rocks. And it's, it's all quite a show. And we should note that the only reason that Laban is here entering into this covenant of equals between his son-in-law and his daughters and himself is because he has no choice. He has no choice. He is completely exposed. He's exposed in front of all the onlookers. Everybody there knows that what Jacob has said is exactly true. And so Laban, when he's in a position of powerlessness, he says, well, how about this? How about we make an agreement? How about we make an arrangement? Now, importantly, in the close here of, of chapter 31, after this emotionally charged speech by Jacob to Laban in front of everybody, Jacob says nothing more to him. In the, in the narrative, not one more word to him after he's done. And what I've written here is that Jacob is just done with this man and he is done with this place. He's over it. We've already put this slide up, but this is a good time to remind us of this slide. God calls us, yes, to love and serve others, our fellow men, our neighbors, but he does not require us to remain in toxic, abusive, and manipulative situations. And so they go through this little ceremony and they have their celebration. But if you read the story carefully, you sense a complete disconnect and a coldness from Jacob to Laban. He's been taken advantage of. He's been exploited. He's been abused and he's over it. He is over it. I, I don't see this last meal as a friendly connection. I see it as the, the nail in the coffin. There's a, there's a finality here. And Laban's going to go his way and continue to be Laban. And Jacob's going to go his way and not continue to be Jacob, as we will soon see. This is, I think, the very last verse of chapter 31. Early in the morning, Laban kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. But no mention is made. I've inserted this of any affection towards Jacob. 
and then he left and returned home, and that's it. Ellen White, in her book, Patriarchs and Prophets, taps into this sense of finality here, that, that this was the last nail in the coffin of the relationship between the people of the land of Laban in Padan Aram and Jacob and his family. She says, with this separation ceased all trace of connection between the children of Abraham and the dwellers in Mesopotamia. Now, just a word about that. I have quoted uh, quite a little bit from the book Patriarchs and Prophets in this series, and I just cannot recommend highly enough, I mean, I just want to say it with all of the enthusiasm and energy that I can muster, you need to read this book. I mean, if you really want to understand the Old Testament, you need to read not only Patriarchs and Prophets, but also the follow-up volume, Prophets and Kings. I have here the Types and Symbols version, which is the new version that I absolutely love. It's beautiful. It's, I, I can't say enough good about it. You can learn more at typesandsymbols.com. Go support them. They're a wonderful uh, Seventh-day Adventist Christian design firm and company that's printing these books. And uh, if you don't already own a set of these incredible books, you need to go get one. Uh, I, I just urge you to do so. But I've also been reading, I haven't quoted from it much, but I've also been reading from this excellent translation and commentary by Robert Alter, and uh, highly recommend, highly recommend. He's a scholar, Hebrew scholar, and uh, he's not only done Genesis, he's done the entire Old Testament, I think. And uh, I've really enjoyed this. I've not quoted from it a lot, but it has really helped me with my, my insights. Um, okay, continuing on here. You maybe heard somebody say something like this at a wedding or in the context of their child getting married. They'll say something like, look, I don't want to lose a son. You know, we don't want to lose a son. We want to gain a daughter. And, and that's very beautiful. You know, we don't want to lose a daughter. We want to gain a son. But if you parent in an overbearing and controlling and manipulative way, like Laban, you're going to lose both. You're not only, you're, you're gonna not only not gain a son or gain a daughter, you're gonna lose the one you do have. And that's exactly what's happened here with Laban. Not only is there a geographical separation, as we've already seen, there's an emotional separation. The daughters are over it. I mean, they were merely tools in his hand that they manipulate, that he manipulated to bring about a positive financial end. And all the way back in our second presentation together, titled No Soup For You, you might remember in our takeaways and applications, we said this, and I've circled it there for you. Parents must leave room for their children to learn, to grow, and even to fail. Leave room, right? We, we have to allow our children room to grow and to mature, not micromanage them, not manipulate them, and not control them, right? And as they age, they should get more and more freedom and more and more room. And this is something that Laban did not do well, and it presents us an opportunity to reflect on how to parent well. At least in principle, you have to maximize freedom, especially as they age, and de decrease control and restriction, and have no manipulation and, you know, uh, uh, manipulation and, uh, what's the word I'm looking for there? Sort of coercion, all right? This is a, a great song from an old rock band, strangely enough, called 38 Special. And I don't normally quote from rock bands, but I'll tell you, they hit the nail on the head here with what it is to love and how you love correctly. And it says here, this is the uh, chorus of a well-known song, just hold on loosely. That's the name of the song. Hold on loosely, but don't let go. Now, now, now just feel that, just hear that. Hold on. We want to hold on to our children. We want to hold on to our spouse. We want to hold on to those that we love. But you don't hold on with a tight grip where you're controlling and they can't go anywhere or do anything or grow or breathe. Oh, no. You hold on loosely. The song continues. If you cling too tight, babe, you're going to lose control. Everyone that we try to control, we will eventually lose. We will lose either geographically or emotionally. We will lose them, right? So I love this, and it's just so poignant, and it's so true. If you cling too tight, babe, you're going to lose control. Your baby needs someone to believe in and a whole lot of space to breathe in, don't let her slip away. Well, that's what Laban has done here. Of course, 38 Special is referencing probably a romantic love, but the point stands. Love cannot control. Love cannot manipulate. Love cannot coerce. Yes, you can hold on, but we have to hold on loosely. And I like that language there. You gotta give them something to believe in, something that they want to be loyal to, that they are attracted to, that they want to remain with, because if you cling too tight, you're going to lose control. All right, 
With that in mind, we now move to Numbers 2 and 3, which is Jacob's hostile encounter with God, which is where we're going to spend most of our remaining time, and then his assumedly hostile encounter with Esau, which is how we will close, and it will be beautiful. All right. In the flow of the narrative, now that we're in chapter 32 and 33, Jacob's encounter with Yahweh, this theophany, as theologians would call it, is really inseparable from his encounter with his brother Esau. And there is a theological reason for this as well as a narrative reason. This is because both of these encounters, his encounter with his hostile encounter with God and his, what he assumes will be a hostile encounter with Esau, are at a deeper level, at last, at long last in the story of Jacob, an encounter with Jacob's true self, who Jacob really is. And we've already noted that Jacob's life is a life of struggle and a life of conflict. And in the actual sort of structure of Genesis uh, chapters 32 and 33, it might look something like this, ABA. So we have this preparation to encounter Esau, in which we'll see he's going to send gifts and he's going to be praying and he's going to divide his camp in order to prepare for this, what he assumes will be a hostile encounter. Then right in the middle of this is this encounter with Yahweh, right? And then uh, the encounter with Esau is resumed. So we have to see these two as kind of part of the same encounter, which at its like basic level is an encounter with himself, the confrontation with himself, at long last, a struggle with himself. And this is where the series has been going all along, and it's where the story has been going all along. All right, let's continue to read now. We're in chapter 32, beginning in verse 3. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, and two times he's very careful when he instructs them about how these scouts, these messengers that are sent out ahead, how they are to approach Esau and exactly what they are to say. And notice what he says here. This is what you are to say. Very precise instruction. My Lord Esau. Now that should just jump off the page. My Lord Esau. Now watch this. Your servant Jacob. Ah, are you seeing now an inversion of that that answer to prayer, that prophecy that had been given all the way back to Rebekah years and years before, the older will serve the younger and one will be stronger than the other? Or even in the blessing that Isaac spoke over Jacob when he deceived Isaac and led him to believe that he was Esau, may your brothers bow down to you, may you be Lord over your brothers? Well, it was assumed that the one that would be the Lord was Jacob. But actually here, paradoxically, and in this incredible, un the unfolding of this incredible narrative, Jacob is now saying, my Lord Esau, your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there until now. I have cattle and donkeys and sheep and goats and male and female servants. Now I am sending this message to my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. Now, as you read chapters 32 and 33, Jacob's repeated use of your servant and my Lord reveals his state of mind right? His fear and his anxiety, both of which are born out of guilt and a desire to not see his brother, right? If at all possible, he would love to avoid seeing Esau, but he's been called back to his land and God has promised that he will be with him. And so he's in a very fearful frame of mind. Verse six, when the messengers returned back to Jacob, they said, well, we went to your brother Esau, but now he's coming to meet you with 400 men. And this would have just caused Jacob's heart to sink. His worst fears are now coming to pass. 400 men are with him in great fear and distress, the text says. Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, in the flocks and the herds and the camels as well. And he thought, well, if Esau comes and attacks one group, then perhaps the other group may be left to escape. Then Jacob prayed. Well, of course he prayed. In that circumstance, so would you. So would anybody. And he says, oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. He's reminding God of God's own command and promise. And then he says in verse 10, and this is so important, I am unworthy. Yes, feel that. I am unworthy of all the kindness and of all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. I only had a staff when I crossed into Jordan, but now I have so many people that they can be divided into two camps. And then this, verse 11, and this is really the, 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 the punchline of the whole prayer, the, the, the essence of the whole prayer. Save me, I pray. I mean, ultimately, this is a prayer for deliverance. It's a prayer for salvation. 
Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid that he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, and this is such a, it really, this is a model of how to pray. We tell, we're honest with God. Look, I'm afraid and I'm scared. And then we remind God of what he himself has said. We remind him of his promise. We remind him of his word to us. You said, I will surely make you prosper and I will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. He reminds him. And so, and we're not going to go through this. There's a, a very specific way in the sort of middle section there, actually kind of toward the beginning of chapter 32, where he starts sending huge gifts. I mean, an astonishing amount of gifts. Let me just read uh, maybe a little bit of this. It, it says, um, oh, do I have it right here? I'll make your descendants great. Okay, here it is. He spent the night there, and from there, I'm in verse 13. And from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. Listen to this. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, 10 male donkeys, I mean, he sounds a little bit like Abraham's servant when he arrived there at the, at the well with Rebecca, right? Like he is clearly trying to appease his brother's presumed wrath, right? Like he, he's doing everything he can to say, look, I'm not coming back to claim my inheritance. I'm not a threat to you. I'm really sorry. And that's what we've got here on this slide. This is crucially important. In effect, he is offering himself as his brother's servant in an effort to make restitution for his treacherous deception so many years before. That's what's going on there. And this story is finally coming full circle. The, the, the one that had grasped, the one who had deceived, the one who had laid snares is now humbly, meekly, and you know, generously laying himself before his brother in terror, in fear. And so then we get to verse 24. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions, so Jacob was left alone. And you should feel that. He's alone. He's a man alone. Yes, he's got a large you know, uh, group of people, a crowd of people that are traveling with him. Yes, but he's alone. He's alone in his own head. He's alone in his own spirit. He's alone in his own heart. And you are supposed to feel that because up to this point in the narrative, we've been told over and over again, Jacob's state of mind, right? Verse seven, he, he says, I'm in fear and great distress. Verse 10, he says, I am unworthy. Verse 11, I am afraid. So when we finally come here to verse 24, Jacob was left alone. He's alone, not just in the sense of no one is with him bodily, he is alone in the world. He's a man without a country. He's a man without a cause. He's a, he's a man without a hope, except he does have one last little bit of hope. Can God's promise be trusted? Right? He reminds him, you, you're the one that told me. You're the one that told me. And so Jacob, he, in his great distress, both plans and prays. He doesn't only pray and he doesn't only plan. And friends, let that be a lesson to us. When we're in great distress, when we don't know if we should go right or left, when we're in fear, when we're uncertain, when we're unstable, you don't choose between planning and praying. You plan and pray. And so he divides his camp into two, and then he goes across the ford of the river Jabbok, actually pronounced Yabbok, or Yabbok, Yabbok. And he prays, he pours his heart out to God. Look at verse 24. So Jacob was left alone. And in the night, in the darkness, not only of the night, but the darkness of his soul, he feels a strong, heavy hand on him. And what does he immediately assume? I mean, instinctively, reflexively assume. Well, this is Esau. This, this has to be Esau when the hand is placed on him because he's in such a, a state of mind where all he can think is, is the world is my enemy and, and my brother's out to get me and I'm left alone. He instinctively turns, as most people would, everybody would in this circumstance, and he fights for what he thinks is his life. I mean, what a story here. And, and this is where we encounter one of the great iconic stories in all of Scripture. And, and you see Jacob wrestling, and he's going to put forward superhuman efforts to try to overcome an assailant that he thinks means him harm, that he thinks is out to kill him, that he very likely thinks is his own brother Esau, coming to finally do what he said he would do so many years before. I will kill my brother Jacob. 
And so they wrestle and they wrestle and they wrestle. But as they wrestle, it becomes obvious that this is no ordinary assailant. I mean, no doubt in their lives, Jacob and Esau had rested, wrestled before. I mean, I've wrestled with my brother many, many times, and my sons have wrestled many, many times. And you kind of know what it is to wrestle your brother, even if they're bigger than you, even if they're stronger than you. If you're putting forward superhuman, seemingly supernatural efforts to save your life, and yet you're just not getting any headway. Now, I, I grew up as a wrestler. A lot of people don't know that about me, but I wrestled from the time I was about seven years old all the way into high school. That's what I did. It was my sport. It was my main sport, wrestling. I love wrestling. I love grappling. And it's a lot of fun just to, to get with somebody that's about your same size and, and to try and master them. So it's, it's both a, a game of the mind and a game of the body, right? Wrestling or grappling or jujitsu. And, and here uh, he's putting forward these superhuman efforts and he just can't understand why he can't get, he just can't get a one up, which then begins to raise the question, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this Esau after all? Who, who could this mysterious assailant be? Well, there's no need to wonder. Brueggemann in his commentary in Genesis says it as plain as can be, and it's where the narrative has been going all along. The hidden one is Yahweh. Yahweh, the very God who had made the promises, the very God who had appeared to him at Bethel. He's wrestling with Yahweh, with the angel of the covenant, with God himself. And by angel of the covenant, I just mean the messenger of the covenant, the one who has appeared to him, who has made promises to him. The one who ate cheese with Abraham all the way back earlier in Genesis under the trees. The, the, the one who's been with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob all along. He's not wrestling with Esau. He's not wrestling with some other assailant. He's wrestling with Yahweh. Brueggemann continues, the hidden one is Yahweh. On his way to his brother whom he wants to appease, and I love this, Jacob must first deal with his God. Before he can meet Esau, he has to meet his God. And in meeting his God, he will meet himself. He will at last meet himself. Verses 25 and onward, when the man saw that he could not overpower him, that is to say overpower Jacob, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that the hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go. It's daybreak. I need to leave. Jacob now knows that he's wrestling someone of of, of a supernatural character. And he senses that it's Yahweh himself. And so he cries out, and you've got to hear this in the flow of everything we've been studying over the last six weeks. You've got to hear this going all the way back and remembering the symmetry and the similarities in this story. I won't let you go unless you bless me. And, and that request should just jump off of the page because it's the very request that that Jacob had illegitimately sought so many years before, not from his heavenly father, but from his earthly father, Isaac. I need a blessing, a fatherly blessing, but, but not a deceitfully obtained blessing, a legitimately obtained blessing. I mean, this was, friends, the deepest longing of Jacob's broken and guilty and fearful heart to be blessed, not illegitimately blessed, not illegally blessed, not deceptively blessed, but to be blessed. And so here he just knows, wait a minute, this isn't Esau. This is God himself. And so he clings to him with, with great energy. And even though his, his hip is in great pain, and Ellen White, again, in Patriarchs and Prophets, does an incredible job of, of painting this picture. He wants the blessing. He craves the blessing. His whole life has now come full circle, but he's not going to get the blessing until he answers the question. The same question. Yes, that very question. The man said to him, oh, you want the blessing. What is your name? Oh, friends, do not miss that. What is your name? This is the question. It's, it's that question. It's the question that had no doubt haunted him for the last 20 plus years. What is your name? Who are you really? I mean, let's remind ourselves when he went into that chamber with his, with his aging, visually impaired father, he said, my father, yes, my son, who is it? I am Esau. And we made this point. 
You might remember we made the point that, that the whole story, the whole narrative of Jacob's life turns on this hinge right here. Those three words, those three syllables, I am Esau. And so when he clings to this mysterious assailant and says, no, I can't let you go. You're my last hope. He senses in his innermost being that he's wrestling with a supernatural assailant, Yahweh himself. And he says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. I mean, just feel this. This is the longing desire of the fear-filled, uncertain, unstable, guilt-ridden heart of Jacob. I long for a blessing, but not an illegal blessing, not an illegitimate blessing. I long for a true blessing. And God longs to bless, but he can't bless until full circle. The same question has been asked, what is your name? Who are you, really? And then we can appreciate this answer. Jacob. In verse 27, he said, Jacob. Now we say Jacob, but remember that the, the, the Hebrew word here, and I probably aren't, I'm probably not doing a perfect job pronouncing it, but it's Yaakov. We've already talked about that. That's heel catcher, the layer of snares, the supplanter. We've said this is the this is the guy we've been with all through this journey, all through this story. When God says to him, What is your name? Are you Esau? Are you still Esau? Are you still a man without a country, a man without a name? When he says, Yaakov, Jacob, he's saying, I'm crooked. I'm a deceiver, I'm a supplanter, I'm the one that grabs the heel, I'm a liar, and I'm afraid. And when the confession is made, when the admission is made, when the brokenness has occurred, then Yahweh can finally at last say to this man something that could have been said many years before, but can only now be said. Verse 28, then the man said to him, not anymore. Not anymore. No longer, and just feel the beauty of this, no longer will your name be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans, and at last you have overcome. But how has he overcome? In what sense has he overcome? Let, let's unpack what, what's going on here because it, it can't be just a jujitsu match. It can't be just a wrestling match. I mean, something else is going on. A lot more is going on here. The, the change of the name from Jacob, which is the, the layer of snares and the supplanter and the heel catcher, to Yisrael, and, and the etymology of, of Yisrael is not totally known for sure, but it, it appears to be something like God fights or God rules or God preserves and protects. God prevails. The changing of the name is incredible. What is your name? Do you really want this blessing, this legitimate blessing, this legal blessing? I long to have, I long to have that blessing. What is your name? And then in the story, it's quite funny actually, uh, fascinating and, and funny, Jacob actually turns his attention to Yahweh, to the assailant, the, 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 the man in the dark. And he says, what's your name? Please tell me your name. And he says, why do you ask my name? In other words, it's not my history that's on trial here. It's not my, it's not my character that's on trial here. It's not my life and my decisions and my deceptions that are on trial here. My name is not the point here. And then he blessed him. He blessed him. And friends, just, just feel that. Just, just let that wash over you right now. He got it. He got the blessing. And not just the blessing from Isaac, but the blessing from God himself, the father not only of Isaac, but of Abraham and of the whole human race. I mean, the, the best possible fatherly blessing. So he blessed him there and Jacob called the place Peniel, which means the face of God, saying it is because I saw God face to face. He knows it was God. He knows it was Yahweh. And yet my life is preserved. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel and he was limping now because of his hip. 
limping because of his hip. I love the way that Brueggemann puts this. When daylight comes, the stranger is gone. And so is Jacob. At long last, friends, our series is titled Jacob, the faking, breaking, and making of a man. And at long last, Jacob is a godly man. Or more precisely, Israel is a godly man. Now let's just do a little bit of digging here into this wrestling match as we close not only this presentation, but this series. Let's just do a little bit of digging here. What happened in that wrestling match? Well, a lot happened. The blessing and the, the question about the name and the admission that my name is Yaakov, not Esau. But when we sort of pan out and take a larger sort of biblical theological look at this wrestling, we can see that, that in the defeat was the victory and in the humility was the glory and in the weakness was the strength. Right? At the very moment where it looked like Jacob was defeated, he had succeeded. At the very moment where it looked like he was broken, he was healed. At the very moment where it looked like he was at his weakest, he was at his strongest. And, and friends, we've said several times that this story has the grace of God all over it. It's got the gospel all over it. Feel this. This inverted framing, this upside-down framing of power and weakness and of victory and defeat, it turns our mind reflexively and necessarily to who? The crucified yet victorious Messiah. The one who, in the very moment where it looked like he had been defeated, he had been crushed, he had been crucified. The opposite has happened. What looks like defeat is the greatest of all possible victories. Where love has triumphed, where God's mercy and forgiveness have triumphed in a powerful and profound way. Just feel that. Feel that. Let that wash over you. But, but there's even another layer here. I just want to go a little one layer deeper that I think you're going to really like. I'm no Hebrew scholar here, and I don't pretend to, to be one, but there is a, a play on words here that is obvious in the Hebrew, even as somebody who's not a, a scholar of Hebrew, like I am not, and probably you are not either. There's a, there's a play on words here, and I want you to feel this. We, we have, number one, Jacob, which is Jacob. We've talked about this. The, the name means, you know, heel catcher, layer of snares, and supplanter, Jacob. But then Jacob crossed over the river. We say Jabbok, but it's Yabok, Yabok, which fascinatingly, the name means to pour forth or, watch this, to empty. So Jacob crosses over Yabok to Abak to wrestle, to wrestle, right? So just, just feel that. Jacob goes over Yabok to Abak. And the word wrestle in the Hebrew also means not only to wrestle or to grapple, it means to get dusty or just dust, which makes a lot of sense. Because if you're wrestling around, rolling around on the ground, struggling against another person, struggling for the mastery, what happens to you? You're covered in dust. And so the deceiver, the layer of snares goes over the river where he is emptied. He's in the dust, seemingly defeated. And in that empty condition, in that dusty condition, his life is preserved. The blessing is received and the victory is gained. Oh man, one of my all time favorite quotations from the pen of Ellen White picks up this exact idea here. I mean, just feel this. She asks the question, what is justification by faith? Righteousness by faith. She just asked the question outright, right? Almost a, a, a definitionally, like in a dictionary sense, what is justification by faith? And her answer is as good an answer as I have ever read. And I've read literally dozens and dozens of books on justification by faith, righteousness by faith. What is justification by faith? And here is for my money, the best answer maybe that I've ever read, she says, it is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust. Just like Jacob, wrestling in the dust, broken yet healed, defeated yet victorious, crushed yet exalted. Jacob, yet Israel. What is the work of justification by faith? 
It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. This has just got Jacob written all over it because it's got the gospel written all over it. Jacob had tried to do something for himself. He had tried and tried to make a way, but ultimately he made no way. He failed. He faltered. He made a mess of his life. He tried to do for himself what only God could do for him. I want to read it again. It is the work of God laying in the glory, laying the glory of man, excuse me, in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. When men and women see their own nothingness, their own emptiness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Their own nothingness, their own emptiness. Remember, he passed over the, the river Yabbok, which means to pour forth or to empty. Oh, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on here. And friends, don't miss this. When we confess that we are Jacob, we are deceiver, we are liar, we have made a mess of it. We've made a mess of the situation. We've made a mess of our lives. It's in that moment of seeming defeat that God transforms us into Israel. You will no longer be Jacob. You are now Israel. Amazing. The mind now, for me at least, flashes forward to, to several passages from the writings of Paul that again have the gospel all over them and they're just, I just see the story of Jacob here because the story of Jacob is the story of everyone. The, and we'll come to that in just a second, but the story of an encounter with the living God where we are honest with who we actually are. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, Therefore from now on we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now... We know him thus no longer. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The passage continues in verses 18 and 19. Now, all things are of God who has, and notice the word here, reconciled, reconnected. That's what's happening there in that dusty wrestling match on the other side of the river Jabbok. God is reconnecting Jacob to himself. And Paul says here, who has reconciled us to himself through what? Through Jesus. And has given us the ministry of reconciliation, helping others to be reconnected. That is that God was in Christ. Here it is again, reconciling the entire world to himself, not imputing or counting their trespasses to them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, a lot more could be said about this passage, but I want you to feel that part of this reconciliation, this reconnection with God, this being a new creature in Christ, is that God doesn't count our sins against us. Jacob's whole big circuitous life was one giant detour filled with mistakes and failures and deceptions. And when God meets him there, just as he had met him with Bethel, he doesn't primarily point him backward to the catalog and all of his sins. He points him forward, remember? Forward and upward. And here he says, your name is no longer Jacob, what it was in the past. He points him forward. Your name is now Israel. New name, new future, forward and upward. This is a passage from Paul that we actually read in our very first session together. Number one, where Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 29, think about the circumstances of your call, brothers and sisters. Not many who were wise by human standards, not many were powerful, not many were born to a privileged position. Jacob was not born to a privileged position. Esau was born to the privileged position. But listen to me very carefully here. While we are not born to a privileged position, we can be born again into the most privileged position, sons and daughters of the Most High God. But God chose what the world thinks is foolish to shame the wise, and God chose what the world thinks is weak to shame the strong. What looks like weakness is actually strength. What looks like defeat is actually victory. What looks like brokenness is actually healing. What looks like failure is actually success. God chose what is low and despised in the world, what is regarded as nothing, to set aside what is regarded as something so that no one can boast in his presence. And this then, our, our final passage here from Paul, brings to my mind Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world, the only thing we can boast in is God and in his goodness, not in us because 
Our boasting is in nothingness, it's in emptiness. I'm going to say it again. What is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust, wrestling us into submission, wrestling, wrestling us to the ground, and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. When men see their own nothingness, their own emptiness, they realize there is nothing with which to boast or of which to boast. They are prepared, hallelujah, to be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Friends, Jacob's experience will be that Jacob's experience of wrestling with Yahweh himself and thinking in a moment that, that the assailant means harm, that the assailant wants to hurt, that the assailant wants to punish and even to kill. But actually the assailant comes to bring life. Brokenness, yes, but a brokenness that results, results in healing. Look at what we've got on the screen here. Jacob's experience will be that of anyone who moves closer to God and who wrestles with him about who they really are. Not the veneer of who we are, not the pretense of who we are, not some play acting about who we are, but who we really are. And as we wrestle with God, the incrimination of our own conscience, I would add, amplified by the accusing voice of Satan, causes us to feel that we will be cast off. I felt that. Have you felt that? In our wrestling, we cling to God and we say, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me because our own conscience condemns us. And then the accusing voice of Satan mingles with our own guilty conscience and we feel that we have no hope in the world. But it is, in, it is in that very moment of brokenness, the very thing that Jesus was saying when he said in the very opening beatitude of the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those that recognize their spiritual poverty, their nothingness, their emptiness, that they have nothing to glory in except God and his mercy and his forgiveness. Friends, this new name from Yaakov to Israel is not just a new name, it's a new future. And I can't emphasize this strongly enough. God doesn't cause us to go back like a dog to its vomit in our old sins, in our old ways, in our past, in our history. God turns us right round, points us forward and upward with a new name and a new future. Because the gospel of God's grace has overcome those accusatory voices in our head and from the accuser of the brethren, Satan himself. And God has prevailed with mercy and with forgiveness and with restoration. Amen and amen. In his commentary on Genesis, Brueggemann comes to the end of this amazing, iconic biblical story of the wrestling between Yahweh and Jacob. And he says, what, what kind of a God is it? What kind of a God is it that will be pressed so nearly to a draw by this man? I mean, this was obviously a great conflict, almost a draw. It would have been a draw if God had not supernaturally just used a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of his power and touched the hip of Jacob and immediately put it out of socket. That's when Jacob knew he wasn't wrestling with Esau or anyone like Esau. He was wrestling with God himself. And Brueggemann says, what kind of a God is this that will be pressed to nearly a draw by a man? And I love his answer. And I hope you do too. He says, certainly no ordinary God because clearly this is no ordinary story. Correct. This is not an ordinary story. And I don't just mean here narrowly the story of Jacob and the story of the wrestling. The story of the God that has revealed himself in scripture and in Christ and in the cross and in the resurrection is no ordinary story. And this is no ordinary God. This is a God who comes willingly, voluntarily, and goes to Calvary's cross seemingly in defeat, seemingly in brokenness, to save Jacobs like you and like me. This is no ordinary story. The gospel is no ordinary story. It's, it's not only, in the words of Alvin Plantinga, the greatest story ever told. It's the greatest story that ever could be told. It is no ordinary story. And this is no ordinary God. And so, Thirdly and finally, we come to Jacob's hostile encounter with Esau. And you can read this in chapter 33. We're not going to go through really much of it at all. Because what he assumes to be a hostile encounter actually turns out to be a glorious family reunion. Because friends, 
as we've already said, in the flow of the narrative, you cannot separate Jacob's encounter with Yahweh from Jacob's encounter with Esau because now his life has come back full circle. We've already put this slide up. You have the preparation to meet Esau and then the actual encounter with Yahweh. And then now here comes the encounter with Esau. And I'm just going to read here, rather than going through the whole of chapter 33, this is Ellen White's brief depiction of what that scene looked like, what that encounter looked like in Patriarchs and Prophets. Read it in chapter 33 and then go read it in Patriarchs and Prophets. It is so beautiful. It is so encouraging. It is so redemptive. It is so, so restorative. The two companies at last approached each other. The desert chief leading his men of war. And Jacob, with his wives and children attended by shepherds and handmaidens and followed by long lines of flocks and herds, leaning upon his staff. And can't you see that? Can't you see that? Leaning upon his staff, injured now, and as near as we can tell from the biblical record, permanently injured, permanently crippled, permanently disabled. But that, that limp, that, that leaning on the staff, that being crippled would remind him every day for the rest of his life of his encounter with Yahweh on the other side of the river Jabbok. Leaning upon his staff, the patriarch went forward to meet the band of soldiers. He was pale and disabled from his recent conflict, and he walked slowly and painfully, halting at every step. But his countenance, his face, was lighted up with joy and peace. This is not a man distressed. This is not a man afraid. This is a man who can meet Esau face to face because he has seen someone far more significant and potentially terrifying than any Esau. He has seen God face to face, Peniel. And he says, I have survived. And if we can meet with God, and if we can wrestle with God, and we can be defeated and healed by God in the same moment, we can meet with anyone. We can look at anyone. We don't need to be afraid. At that sight, at the sight of the crippled sufferer, Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Well, he didn't see that coming. <laughs> he didn't see that coming because the last we heard from Esau, he said, yeah, I'm going to kill my brother. I'm going to kill my brother. And here now is reunion, not hostility, not war, not antagonism, but restoration and healing and reunion. As they looked upon the scene, even the hearts of Esau's rude soldiers were touched. I love what Ellen White does, painting that scene there. You're going to see these two brothers falling on one another, weeping. One, the crippled man, just making his way slowly, haltingly, and the other, this, this mighty man of war, a hunter. They fall on one another's necks. The reunion, the restoration, the connection, the weeping. She says, as the onlookers behold the patriarch's infirmity, they little thought and I like what she does here, that his weakness had been made his strength. Woo, it brings a tear to the eye, doesn't it? I mean, here we are, we're at the end of the story, but in many ways, we're kind of at the beginning of the story. The past is behind us and the future is in front of us. And, and the point here is crucial when we talk about the inseparability between Jacob's encounter with Esau and Jacob's encounter with Yahweh. There's a reason for this. There's a theological reason as well as, well as a narrative reason. And, and the point here is, is this, peace with God makes way for peace with others, even those we imagine to be our enemies. Peace with God is what makes way for peace with others. And the New Testament has so much to say about this. How do we know that we love God? Do we love our brothers? When we make peace with God, friends, we can make peace with the world. We can make peace with those around us. We can make peace even with those that have hurt us. We can make peace even with ourselves. Even with ourselves. Jacob's life has been a life of struggle. We've talked about all of these struggles now in order, and, and we could continue on. This is why I wrestled with where to end the series. Do we end it here? Do we carry on? No, this is the place. I'm convinced this is the place. This is the punchiest and, and most powerful place to end our series on Jacob, the faking, breaking, and making of a man. He has had struggle after struggle, conflict after conflict, and yet here he is, a new man, back in his homeland, 
in a new relationship with his brother. He will soon be reunited with his father Isaac, never again with his mother, sadly. And his story does go on, and there's a lot more that could be said about the life of Jacob. But Jacob going forward is not the same Jacob that has gotten us to this point. He is now Israel. And to quote Brueggemann again, when the daylight comes, the stranger is gone. And so is Jacob. But though Jacob is gone, Jacob, the God of Jacob, and of all the world's many Jacobs, that God remains ever ready to wrestle and to reconcile with his wayward, struggling children. And I want to leave you with three promises that assure us that the God of Jacob is with us. The God of Jacob can be trusted. The God of Jacob is alive. Psalm chapter 46, verse 7, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Well, that, that brings to mind the very promise. I will be with you. I will take care of you. The promise at Bethel. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Psalm 146, verse 5. Happy is he, happy is she, who has the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in Yahweh, his God. And then finally, Psalm 20, verse 1. I just read this recently for my devotions, and I thought, man, I'm so glad I'm reading this in my devotions right now when I'm doing this series on Jacob. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. And we all have days of trouble. And many days of trouble yet to come, no doubt. But may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob, and feel this, let it wash over your soul right now. Feel it in your heart of hearts, in your deepest, innermost part of your being. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. The God of Jacob is the very one who at Bethel so many years before had made the promise, I will give you land and descendants. What did John see there in the book of Revelation? A new heaven and a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth inhabited by a godly people. People just like you and I, transformed Jacobs, dusty Jacobs, crippled Jacobs, people who have had their glory laid in the dust and who have allowed themselves in their nothingness and in their emptiness to be clothed, clothed with the righteousness of Christ. What did he said? I am with you. And God is with you, friend. He's been with us in this series. He's been with you in your life. And God is with you. I will watch over you and keep you. God's promise to you is the same as his promise to Jacob. Are you afraid? Are you uncertain? Are you anxious? Are you sick? God's promise to you is, I've got this. I will watch over you. Remember from our very first presentation, put your hand in the hand of God. It will be better than a light and safer than the known. God's got this. I will bring you back. God will bring you back. He'll bring you back to his original intent in creation, his original intent in making you and making all of the wandering wayward Jacobs of the world. He will bring us back to a goodly land where we as a godly people will inhabit that land, not just for a time, but for eternity. I will not leave you. God will not leave you, friend. I want you to feel that. I want you to just take ownership of that right now. That's God's promise to you. I will not leave you. Have you fallen? Yes, you have. Have you sinned? Yes, you have. Have you made a mistake? Yes, you have. Have you been deceitful? Yes, you have. Have you been a Yaakov, a Jacob? Yes, you have. But God will not leave you. And how do we know all of this is true? Because God said to Jacob at Bethel, and God confirms to us in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ that he will keep his promise. He will keep his promise to you. What a series this has been. The God of Jacob is our refuge, and happy is the person whose God is the God of Jacob. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, you are the God of Jacob. But not only the God of Jacob, Lord, as we have seen here, you are the God of Israel. You are the God that meets us and, and we think you're meeting us to bring harm 
to bring hostility, to hurt us. But Father, in the wrestling and in the brokenness and in our dustiness, we see that we are broken only to be healed. We are defeated only to be victorious. Father, we today receive your promise, the promise of Bethel, that you will not leave us, that you will keep us, that you will watch over us, and that you will bring us back. Father, we need that promise. We need to believe it in our innermost soul, in our innermost hearts. Father, thank you for having been with us in this series through the life of Jacob, the faking, breaking, and making of a man. Father, I pray for all of the Jacobs that are tuning in, that have come on this journey, that they would see this not as a dusty, old, antiquated story, but that they would see this as their story, their story, and that they would feel the promise to them in their wrestling, in their weakness, in their seeming defeat. Your name is no longer Jacob. Your name is Israel. For you have wrestled with God and have prevailed. Father, we prevail in Jesus. We prevail by Jesus. We prevail with Jesus. Thank you for being who you are and for making us who we are and remaking us into who we can be. We know you've done all of this in the glorious, powerful, saving name of Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen.